законодательства и проектов в области инфраструктуры. Традиционно на It's a good tradition that during the legal forum, everybody involved in infrastructure, the businesses, the consultants, the experts, normally discuss the public-private partnership as a fast-developing legal institute and as a trendy method. This year, we decided to expand the issues discussed at the panel, especially with what concerns the new amendments to the civil code and other novel laws. So it's not only the PPP projects that enhance the infrastructure of the Russian Federation. We are getting new tools, new legal tools for investing non-budgetary funds into infrastructure. So the panel discussion today shall not be limited to public-private partnership issues. We shall also discuss other tools and schemes of investment into the infrastructure of Russia. We have the panelists whose presentations are designed as a counterbalance to the trendy issue of uh, PPP that has been trendy for about five to eight years. But so far, it has not yielded any very tangible results, even though this is, of course, disputable. Among our panelists, we have representatives of the business business departments of companies and organizations. We also have people from legal firms who have experience in providing advisory services to public structure, public agencies and uh, companies. And first, I would like to give the floor to Vladislav Zabrodin, the managing capital, uh, the managing partner of Capital Legal Services. Vladislav Zabrodin will tell us about the latest trends and the latest changes in uh, infrastructure-related legislation. He is also going to cover the ongoing changes uh, of the legislation, which uh, of course, affects businesses so that they get better protected when they invest into, into infrastructure. Thank you very much, Alexei. Could you please launch my presentation? I'm sure people will hear our presentations in the catering area perfectly. That's probably one of the reasons they don't believe too much in the, uh, in the de positive development of uh, public-private partnership. I, and uh, uh, this has a lot of bearing to the financial situation of our activities. The new legislation and the new initiatives with regard to PPP is not exactly relating to the development of uh, the latest uh, to the latest development in this country it has a lot of bearing to what's happening in the world uh, how shall i use the later point finally Я вам был включен, вы мне вот в этот ткнули. The World Bank has completed a very interesting research. It was completed last year. And uh, the research is about the global practices related to the public-private partnership. Let us have a look at the pie diagrams here in my slide. You will see that uh, this is actively developing in Asia. And uh, we can see that uh, the, uh, the 70 plus uh, countries uh, are now using the PPP tools. And uh, of course, we can conclude that the public private initiative, as of today, is mostly used in what concerns uh, water supply and uh, sewage, waste 
and uh, waste treatment and energy. Clear enough, the legislator were planning for a broader application of the concept, but if we check the discussions around the PPP ideas, we can understand that uh, mostly not very large, so to speak, projects are the field of application of public-private partnership initiatives in Russia. So this is certainly a new and a not very clear form. So there are serious problems uh, that are uh, related to this at earlier stages. And um, formally, uh, this uh, practice hasn't yet been accumulated. But there is some international experience. And um, within this initiative, private investors try to get an access to a project implementation as soon as possible. And advantages of the uh, for the uh, government is that they don't uh, spend public funds. Sometimes uh, there are uh, problems with that because these um, projects haven't been uh, prepared appropriately at initial stages. Also, there is uh, it is problematic to assess. Um, these um, uh, projects by the government, and uh, there are certain risks um, if um, some other uh, parties would like to participate in this project implementation or they claim that uh, they received information uh, too late. So this is uh, one of um, the um, significant risks um, uh, related to such projects. And definitely, we say that because there are uh, specific terms in our uh, legislation, a very short 30 and 45 days. And this doesn't allow to develop these uh, projects thoroughly. That is why at the initial stages, until all the major mechanisms uh, um, worked out, we will see a situation when there will be um, significant risks and problems uh, related to these projects. And uh, when we analyze the market and the situation with uh, potential investors, they say, oh, yes, it's most interesting, but let's get back to this topic sometime later when there is clear understanding how this might be implemented and when it is possible to avoid these risks. Definitely, development of the law or uh, 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 adjustments um, uh, to the cons amendments to the constitutional uh, legislation. This is based on uh, most uh, successful experience, and it is construction of um, a toll um, lane in Virginia State, and uh, it is part of a federal highway. I um, uh, 95. 495. It, uh, there was great demand um, there and a lot of traffic, but um, originally uh, it was planned to build about 300 uh, office uh, and residential buildings along this highway. And although this um, project was initiated in the 90s, but then bec due to the uh, significant opposition, uh, it was never fully implemented. Then, uh, much later, a private company that was responsible for engineering issues, uh, she, apply, she uh, contacted uh, the uh, operator of this uh, road and she uh, proposed um, a PPP uh, project and the central lane of this highway. The proposal was to convert this um, central lane um, uh, was converted into a toll uh, road. Uh, the uh, payment of the toll itself, the amount of toll, depended on the time of day. And if there were more than three people in a car, then they uh, didn't have to uh, pay uh, for it. And there was um, a positive uh, feedback, and the cost uh, was reduced um, significantly. And from 2005, 
Yeah, they started developing this project and in 2012 they completed its implementation and it became a very good basis for similar projects in other areas and in the United States as well because it uh, became clear how this specific experience can be used uh, elsewhere. Of course, the success of a project uh, is very important and uh, the experience gained by St. Petersburg in uh, this public and private partnership area, uh, it was very important for transferring uh, this experience uh, in other uh, regions um, of Russia. And uh, as we know, all specialists who used to work here in St. Petersburg, uh, later they joined various um, uh, Moscow administrative bodies and uh, they were incorporating their experience there. So the success of the very first uh, project uh, that was uh, based on this uh, private initiative, yeah, we are sure it is absolutely important for the uh, future dissemination of the project. Uh, I would like also to give you another example, and it is not so positive. Um, it, um, it was in Tanzania, and uh, um, this country uh, didn't have any free access to energy resources, and it prevented the country from development. And uh, they signed an agreement with a Malaysian company that um, was supposed to build a power generation plant, but because so many basic principles were violated, starting from the clarity of agreement and finishing with the availability of um, information about disagreement. Due to that, there were so many claims and complaints, and although that project was being implemented and part of the disputes, uh, they were uh, considered and uh, reviewed in the United States and the court decisions um, were in favor of this agreement. Still, that project was terminated and there were still uh, there are still debates about it. And a serious question here is, um, so now Tanzania uh, it has a lawsuit against its ex-president um, because um, they believe that uh, there were corruption aspects to it. As for the Russian practice, I uh, believe it is important to touch upon three major uh, aspects. Uh, this mechanism is very simple and very straightforward, and it is an advantage. But at the same time, uh, it, it, it leads to complexity. Because on the one hand, yeah, it is an efficient way of um, a, a way of private investors applying for implementation of certain projects, but at the same time, there are so many difficulties with the essence and the content of this um, application and with the specific details. So this may lead to reluctance. Um, on the part of administrative bodies, um, and they're reluctant to take any decisions, especially at initial stages. So these principles are absolutely correct and appropriate. The state, from the very beginning, well, it's obvious that there's not enough um, funds. The government would like to implement certain projects, but it's hard to determine priorities. But for the private investors, it's a good way to uh, step uh, in um, and um, start implementation of the project. Uh, we understand that the state um, follows regulation in this sphere, and uh, if this application is submitted, then there are three uh, possible reactions. First, yeah, it is a positive um, decision, then uh, this information is announced, and then for f during a 45-day period, all uh, potential um, participants may prepare their uh, proposals. Secondly, second uh, choice is that, okay, this is interesting information, but um, the uh, investor didn't uh, provide uh, enough um, substantial arguments for this, and then uh, they are requested to clarify their position. And thirdly, the third choice is that uh, this project might be not a priority for the state. Uh, there are certain requirements. Um, 
concerning the documents that should be provided. It is a feasibility study and a technical uh, support of this, but this already uh, is developed at the time when these investors study the situation and when they uh, prepare the documents. Unfortunately, we can state that this is still quite raw. All these requirements are raw, and some of the things are not absolutely transparent. And the whole system related to provision of these documents and informing other investors, um, there's a lot to improve there. Then uh, information about this project should be published on the website uh, called torgi um, dot government dot ru, are you? Um, so this information published there, maybe it won't uh, present a full picture uh, about this project, and maybe it will be not enough for those who might be interested in implementation of this project. So it's not a very efficient source of information for other participants. We believe that it is necessary to consider seriously all issues related to uh, documents and how rejections are um, justified, because um, very often uh, all these requirements are too general, so and it might lead to a situation when um, some uh, rejection is not uh, argu uh, is not supported by argument arguments. But still, I believe we all are quite um, positive and optimistic about this fear. So yes, we are moving forward and we are moving in the right direction. And there is uh, an important foundation existing. The only point which um, is questionable is who will be the initiator. I mean, not the private investor, but at the governmental level, who will be? this initiator, maybe the municip some municipality or a region or something else, then we will see a successful project. Thank you very much, Mr. Zabrodin. I would like to comment upon what was just said about uh, this new institute. We do not really understand how exactly it's going to work. Uh, there are some complaints uh, about it yet. For example, in uh, St. Petersburg, the private initiative for investors who wanted to get a plot of land uh, or a building uh, via public sales uh, was structured since 1990 in a very specific way. The city never involved, never invited an investor on its own accord. They waited for an application from a possible investor. And uh, that was the scheme that uh, was used uh, for a number of regional investment projects. But uh, we believe uh, we don't want to be uh, like uh, a laboratory rat uh, for somebody to stage experiments on. This first experience is very important to assess the viability of the private initiative. Vladislav, what, what do you think uh, about the first results? On the 1st of May, the private financial initiative law uh, regulation has come into force. As uh, a lawyer, do you have uh, any verbal indications of interest from the investors? Are they willing to go out into the regions and practice what's now available? Well, so far, the, the situation looks very skeptical. There are options offered, but regardless of uh, the size of the investor and uh, their impact upon uh, the situation in the regions, all of them say the same. They say, we have a streamlined bid bidding procedure. We do understand it's much more difficult to challenge a bidding than an agreement between two or three actors. So we are, they are, preferring to go the standard tried and tested way. The market is not overexcited about the private initiative projects, so they don't want the risk of somebody challenging their project of choice. 
So yes, we are getting some verbal indications of interest, but no practical indications of interest, not really. In this country, uh, we normally need uh, two components brought together, a need uh, for a project in a, in a region, and uh, the existence of a certain investor ready and willing and capable of implementing the project. And then the two parties must have goodwill to work together. Remember how many entities were involved in the Pulkova project. And uh, lots of them lost trust in that project on their way. Well, yes, we had that famous woman who believed in that project. And uh, that famous woman told everybody, yes, there are problems, but guys, let's look for solutions and let's find them. Once solutions are found, a project is successfully implemented. If we find a region where there is such trust into such projects, then we shall be able to do something. Such projects can be related to schools, public utilities, they are not the most legally complicated uh, projects. Thank you very much, Mr. Zabrodin. The market uh, is uh, pretty conservative uh, towards uh, this tool so far. So what we need uh, is a good contact with local administration. But once we have this contact, why do we need a strange procedure with all those uh, timelines uh, would rather come to terms with a with government official, bring them a set of documents, let them approve it with some working group, and it will be that same public, public initiative in its gray option. With this, I would like to grant the floor to Mikhail Markov, uh, the general counsel for the Russian Direct Investment Fund. He is also the chief lawyer of the Russian Chinese Investment Fund just recently created. Before Mikhail takes the floor, I would like to say that the Russian Fund of Direct Investments has already implemented and funded some projects, some of them with the fund financing, with the, some with the foreign investment participation. As of today, the Russian DIF has not funded a single PPP project, not a single transaction. They either do project financing or they do corporate financing. So probably the non-PPP tool from the point of view of financial institutes can also be made acceptable for domestic and foreign investors. So, Mikhail, do tell us about how you use uh, the PPP schemes or concessions to raise money, to bring money to the Russian infrastructure. Thank you. I shall continue being optimistic, and I shall tell you about some stories of success. It was difficult from the outstart, but looking back now, we can see that it has all happened, and uh, we can tell you about it. The, Russia, the Russian Direct Investment Fund is a sovereign fund of the Russian Federation, and its mission is to bring foreign investment into Russian economy. And the purpose is to generate profit and make the projects profitable uh, for ourselves, for Russian partners, for the Russian side, and for our foreign projects uh, partners. Generating the profit is, of course, our key task. But as a state institute, we are also targeting economic development of the regions and the country as a whole. Infrastructure projects normally are in good line with this purpose. They may not be as uh, profitable as some private equity cap projects, uh, but uh, they generate a long-term flow of cash, and of, and of course they are very positive for the economic development as a whole. So now we have uh, the CIC joint venture uh, within our Chinese-Russian initiative, and it's a railway bridge between Russia and China. 
And uh, uh, yes, we are very close to really building the bridge. The Chinese have already started it. We have uh, won the tender for the reconstruction of, of the Vladivostok airport, which can eventually become a, an, air, an air hub in the Asia-Pacific region. I would like to tell you about some other projects, too. One of the projects uh, is called uh, uh, Fighting Digital Inequality, and the other one is called uh, Smart Counters. One is with Ross Telecom, the other one is uh, with Ross City, the Russian grids. Uh, the essence of the projects is uh, uh, taking a fiber optic cable to remote small villages and settlements uh, with about 250 to 300 inhabitants. We are talking about several thousand such villages. And in the village of Mikhailov Square of Kostroma region, we have already launched uh, such first point of uh, connection. The Ministry of Communication believes that 10% uh, increase in internet per penetration increases the uh, GDP by 1.5 percent. So that's one of the reasons we are doing it. The Smart Counters project uh, is about uh, the electric power counters or meters, the smart meters, uh, rather. And uh, most of the meters in this country is, are pretty obsolete. We can make uh, energy consumption in Russia about 15 percent more efficient. So why am I telling you about these two specific projects? We are attending a legal forum, and uh, implementation of these two projects would not be possible without some legal and uh, legislative prerequisites. Uh, we, are, we have a state contract. Uh, for the construction. One of our partners has the state contract for construction of fiber optic uh, lines, and they are supposed to pay 1.2 percent of their revenues to Ross Telecom for implementation of the project. They could have done the meter part on their own, and they could have saved uh, some funds uh, with the tariffs. But what is uh, the point, what was the point of involving the Russian Direct Investment Fund together with the foreign partners, instead of having to wait for 10 years and implement all those projects very gradually, we are providing full funding, and Ross Telecom and Ross Grids are paying us the money back. So even today, all the projects can be implemented. In the nearest future, the consumers uh, shall be able to use uh, the internet and use the meters. And uh, us, uh, as the financial investor, will get uh, will reach our targeted uh, profitability. We are not implementing the project on our own. We have a foreign co-investor, which is the, foreign, the sovereign fund of the uh, Arab Emirates, United Arab Emirates. Uh, for them, for the foreign investors, infrastructure is something easy to understand. They do know that in Russia uh, there is underinvestment in this sector, and they're happy to come over and help. So. How did we make uh, this, these projects so profitable, and why are they unique? These are the first two projects uh, uh, found, founded with the uh, with, uh, IMB money. And uh, this happened for the first time, and uh, FNB funds uh, are provided to us, are granted to us, uh, on inflation plus one terms. Uh, and uh, they, their funding can be up to 40 percent of uh, the project amount, uh, the project cost, uh, which makes the project very attractive for other investors. This was our first experience. So we worked together with the core ministries and agencies. We try to find interesting and effective schemes of implementation, and I believe we 
succeeded in doing that. The very essence of public funding is that uh, project companies, the SPVs, uh, issue bonds uh, and they are purchased by the Ministry of Finance. That That's normally the end of uh, the state participation. Of course, it's very difficult to obtain that initial funding. It requires a complex procedure of getting approvals for the project passport and so on. Of course, my fund has some preferences, but nevertheless, it's difficult. But once you prove the feasibility of the project, then it becomes uh, quite technical. There, there are some regimes uh, of uh, accounts you have to comply with. It's just a little bit more complicated than a regular bond loan. After it's all over, the stakeholders of the project, the project owners, can come to an agreement in the in the format that's mutually acceptable. They can use foreign law, like British law, which sometimes happens, and that's okay. We have chosen the Russian law jurisdiction. We used all the novel laws, including the corporate agreement for legislation. We were set no limitations. We could choose our own way. So we believe this scheme is quite feasible and should be used further on. And uh, I would now ask the moderator to give the floor over to Anton Juplin, uh, representing the Alrud law firm who were supporting us in this project. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, so now uh, the floor is mine. I would like to tell you about uh, some of the projects uh, that uh, Michael has mentioned. Firstly, our major idea is that infrastructure projects uh, they can be structured not only with the use of some classical PPP mechanisms, but uh, some um, normal uh, standard um, uh, civil agreement um, mechanisms. And I uh, suggest I suggest we uh, take a look at statistics which is available in the area of infrastructure projects and surveys conducted by Ernst & Young uh, company uh, demonstrated that um, it was planned that by 2009 hundreds of um, projects uh, would have been implemented and it was expected that only 34 percent um, was aiming at PPP uh, model and uh, some um, of them uh, sh should be private invest investments. So this is quite, um, so there's no statistics, these are just forecasts. So um, these um, forecasts demonstrate that PPP mechanisms are extremely important uh, for implementation of infrastructure projects, but they are not um, unique uh, models. There can be other alternatives as well. Speaking about these other options, uh, these are corporate uh, infrastructure uh, projects. And through our experience and through what uh, we see in the market, we believe this is the most competitive option and the uh, most uh, competitive, uh, viable alternative to PPP. What do we mean by this? Of course, if we take a look at the infrastructure uh, project, being it a bridge or some um, internet connection in some remote parts of this country, or uh, improving um, energy efficiency, so if we look at it as an investment project, we will see that the market practices have uh, been developed already um, that protect interests of uh, this party and that party, and it, it can provide a high flexibility for managing relations between them. And there are also many other mechanisms 
uh, which are standard and they are uh, common uh, for managing commercial deals. And we see that situations that involve attraction of many investors, not only one investor, or when there are foreign investors and um, it is important for them to uh, select uh, the appropriate law and when financing comes from a variety of sources, we see that these corporate forms, they uh, provide more options for uh, providing um, this um, financing and structuring it. We also uh, see that uh, public funds can be involved in this and uh, the role the national welfare fund funds role is increasing in this respect because they implement uh, projects uh, with the use of public funds uh, you know, as for this slide let's uh, omit it because michael has already outlined the essence of the projects that have been implemented by this um, fund, Russian Direct Investment Fund. Uh, we were involved in each of these projects and together with this company, uh, with this fund, uh, we were pioneers. As for specifics of uh, these projects and in what way they are different from some um, regular agreements and uh, deals, first of all, uh, this is participation of the National Welfare Fund because um, it means that there will be some additional requirements. Uh, special reports uh, that a project company should produce, then some special account and uh, um, Ministry of Finance uh, is involved, then uh, approval of uh, many approvals of the investment passport of the project. So it reduces the flexibility of this company's work in the future. Uh, but of, of course, all aspects, uh, they have been taken into account when we were working on these projects and we were preparing and structuring them. And we hope that um, it is uh, one of the most uh, successful um, examples of um, our uh, cooperation. Going back to corporate <coughs> forms, of uh, structuring infrastructure projects. What else should be said? And I'm going to be very brief. And Alexander Dojcinova is going uh, to um, provide more uh, details on that in Bulgaria and other countries. What is um, important here? Uh, a most popular corporate form, which it, it, it has been widely used in the Latin America. And we cannot um, make just one conclusion how successful it was, because in the literature and in the reviews, uh, we see both negative and positive examples. Partly, um, it was um, implemented in the Maldives and in Japan. And uh, in J you know, Japan, this corporate form is viewed uh, not to be very efficient. Uh, at the same time, uh, France and Germany, they use um, this corporate structuring of this uh, project a lot. And they also used uh, some hybrid um, form. It is a combination of uh, traditional uh, project forms and uh, public and private partnerships. So this is um, our uh, experience and our uh, practical uh, lessons that we learned. We can say that corporate form provides more flexibility. And this is very often accepted by international investors very well. Sometimes they wish to uh, select uh, some other uh, law or other jurisdiction 
for implementation of it because they believe that um, all um, disputes will be uh, considered by uh, Russian courts and uh, they have concerns that maybe this court uh, won't um, take the most appropriate decision. So then um, uh, some uh, international uh, courts can be selected. Then contractual regulation, it provides a lot of instruments and uh, amendments uh, in the civil uh, code, uh, which will become effective starting next week. Uh, uh, liability and uh, you know damages um, issue uh, and all 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 this um, is now worked out and um, one of the parties uh, may have the right to terminate this contract um, if uh, some if an, the other party violates um, their duties um, of of course, um, there are certain uh, drawbacks um, if we speak about this corporate form of uh, project structuring. The availability of all these complicated mechanisms for an infrastructure project, it means that there should be a lot of uh, documents developed. If money from the National Welfare Fund are um, involved, then uh, usually bonds are issued and the Ministry of Finance um, acquires these bonds from the project company. So there's a question how efficient might it be? What if the Ministry of Finance uh, purchases these bonds um, by um, tranches? And then emission, bond emission, it takes uh, some time. All this um, ex makes implementation of this project longer. And you know that PBP regulation, it involves a requirement of minimum income and insured uh, for the parties. So options can be uh, select, um, selected but um, these will be contractual, more at the contractual level, not regulatory. Thank you, Anton. I have a question. I don't know whether you or Michael should um, answer. From what you both have said, I see that a corporate um, a structure of the project provides more flexibility and the invest, uh, both for the funds and for the investors participating in this project. At the same time, it was not possible uh, to see, uh, to use some mechanism to reduce uh, market risks uh, drastically for those projects that um, were implemented by the investor. And in PPP projects, you know, the um, public side supports not only supports the investor, not only um, in the area of removing some barriers, but also it sort sort of guarantees uh, demand for it. So, um, can you uh, give us uh, your position on this? So, what about these um, risks? Can you ensure? Can you meet the risk appetite of the foreign investors? Then maybe we can find some other infrastructure projects in Russia, or do you believe that you found some unique uh, niche? And um, you accepted uh, this market risk and uh, what? Yeah, I'm going to respond. It um, It's not the point of uh, PPP or corporate um, regulation uh, project. If and uh, why we didn't participate in uh, public and private partnerships, because there were no uh, projects um, which uh, provided enough um, returns, uh, especially in the current uh, situation, for foreign investors. Um, for example, when the um, finance uh, British roads construction, they get 12%. Uh, percent. Um, and uh, here we cannot ensure this. 
Um, and uh, as for our projects, we didn't take up any uh, risks. Okay, we structured these projects in such a way that through various obligations, um, contracts, agreements, um, uh, so we developed this form. In fact, it is not public and uh, private uh, partnership, but it is very similar. So these risks, yeah, they have been specified and shared by us. And you can um, read it in our obligation agreement. So you developed uh, something similar to a PPP project, uh, but you didn't take up um, all the risks, um, uh, but it, it, it's something like that, yes. Okay, Antona, what about uh, these new amendments uh, to the civil code? Do they allow all this? Yes, we welcome these amendments very much. And uh, this is uh, a clause on options. And uh, this word is used, uh, options. And uh, definitely now the regulator understands that this, uh, these are like guarantees. And then indemnity, indemnity notion is also included. And uh, actually, we hope that the practice will change uh, to the better and both the regulator and the courts um, will um, have uh, better practices. And even before these amendments, it was obvious how the market was using uh, these mechanisms. And in my presentation, I didn't mention one point. We all understand that, unfortunately, uh, there have been not so many projects implemented with the classical concession or PVP models. And if we speak about the corporate uh, structure, you know, there has been uh, hundreds and thousands uh, of agreements. It is uh, clear how this or that risk can be mitigated. And this practical support of these uh, corporate uh, mechanisms, it, it, this is a very powerful driver that will um, not um, allow corporate structure uh, to be neglected and to be substituted by the public and private partnership mechanisms. So you are saying that those amendments in the civil code that now have brought up um, this um, structure closer to the market, you believe it gives a new impulse uh, it gave a new impulse for packaging infrastructure projects even within the Russian regulation using uh, mechanisms that have been uh, tested and trialed in other jurisdictions. So now they can be used here in Russia. Yes, um, I, I totally agree. And uh, yeah, when we were I implementing uh, some of these projects, these amendments, uh, they ha haven't been um, effective. But even before that, we had some uh, good um, mechanisms. Um, and uh, you know, one of the first uh, infrastructure projects it was um, was um, implemented in line with the Russian regulation and it was okay for the investor. And when the investor was evaluating the risks, um, he um, realized that yes, uh, he could accept it and uh, he could trust um, Russian courts. Oh, good. And I hope there will be more and more investors who will um, be confident in the Russian uh, legislation. Now, I would like to give the floor to our colleague from another country, Alexander Daichinov, who is from Shonher, if I uh, un un pronounce it correctly. Alexandra has uh, um, a very good experience of advising uh, companies in the sphere, and I would like to hear from Alexander what experience exists in other countries and uh, if um, you have um, some advisory experience uh, in um, Russia, maybe you could compare uh, which uh, jurisdiction is better. Thank you very much. If you uh, allow me, I will continue in English. If I can speak in Russian. 
Um, I will do my best. Um, le let's see if I dare at the end to make a comparison which is better uh, Bulgaria or Central Europe or Russia from what we have seen. Um, I will say a few words on the structuring of the investment vehicles. Anton already started uh, talking about that. Um, with a focus on energy projects because this is our biggest practice and uh, with a focus on, um, on um, Southeastern Europe where um, I am active. Um, I, I think I will wish Russia luck uh, with the new PPP regulations uh, because Bulgaria failed totally so far to realize um, a PPP act. Um, we had a lot of uh, clever lawyers working on the act for several years. It was adopted in January 2013 um, and then actually to the lack of any practical interest, a year later a new government came and cancelled the law. Um, so we had a PPP law in Bulgaria which was on paper following the European principles, um, but we have zero projects realized under the law. Um, so we are now back to the good old practice to use uh, corporate vehicles, as already mentioned by Anton, uh, for all projects which we define as PPP. So we call it PPP, but the PPP nature of the project is that we have a public partner and we have a private partner. Um, these companies are established under the general corporate law, so there is no specific regime. Um, if I understood correctly from Anton, you have cases in Russia where you have a special supervision by the Smetna uh, Palata, the, the control body. Uh, this is not the case in, in Bulgaria. Uh, this is a normal corporate vehicle, a company um, which uh, would not have any too specific um, um, reporting requirements, for example. Um, the jurisdiction of incorporation may be relevant uh, with regard to infrastructure projects and we are saying, you, as, uh, as a rule of a thumb, the jurisdiction of incorporation would be there where the most um, assets are located. And um, I know when all of you hear Bulgaria and infrastructure project in one sentence, I guess that South Stream is ringing bells. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Bulgaria was, by the way, um, was actually yeah, in the past tense uh, lucky because we would have had um, two gas pipeline projects, Nabucco and South Stream uh, were supposed to, to pass Bulgaria. Um, at the end, none of them is realized, or for the time being, we still don't know what's about um, uh, the final situation with South Stream. Uh, but in that relation, we had um, a, a gas interconnector project between Bulgaria and uh, Greece, um, where the infrastructure was passing Greece and Bulgaria, but the major part of the infrastructure was in Bulgaria, so we decided back then it was a Bulgarian a public company and a Greek co a public company and some private investors, so we established and uh, we incorporated then the vehicle in Bulgaria uh, because um, the law governing also the infrastructure was, or the major part of the infrastructure was Bulgaria. Um, Someone mentioned already that the joint venture agreement, which we abbreviate as a JVA, uh, can be governed by laws uh, different than the law of the um, country of incorporation. This is valid for, for all European jurisdictions, not only in Bulgaria. Um, I need to admit having a public partner on board, it is rather difficult to insist on a law different than the law of the um, place where the uh, public partner is located. So at the end, um, we end up with Bulgarian law in Bulgaria governing the JVA, and um, I need to admit that international private partners are also not very happy about it, um, because it has certain uncertainties. Uh, applicability of Bulgarian law and having a public partner usually means a jurisdiction of Bulgarian courts. Um, which, to be very honest, we also try to avoid. So um, what we have in most cases is application of Bulgarian law, but in the case of disputes under the joint venture agreement, we see that we go to international arbitration somewhere abroad. Um, just a note on the side, of course, if you go for the corporate form of a joint venture, uh, you may need to go through a merger control procedure, a notification to the uh, competition authority. Um, in the relevant country. Um, on the choice of a private partner, you had um, a few words said already. Uh, we've seen tenders, we've seen a lot of uh, direct negotiation too. 
Uh, direct negotiation is clear and, of course, acceptable where there is actually no option for another partner. Uh, this was again the case with Southstream. Southstream is um, established, I believe, in every jurisdiction where the pipeline is passing. I can say for sure for Bulgaria. We have a 50-50 joint venture between the Bulgarian Energy Holding and Southstream, um, which is basically a, a public-private partnership, and obviously the Bulgarian Public Authority could not choose another partner than the Southstream entity for that project. Um, tenders. We do see not only in Bulgaria, but in the region also private tenders. That means the contracting authority or the authority who is, um, which is participating in the uh, joint venture is not necessarily a procurement authority under the procurement laws. Uh, that means they can announce a private tender and do not need to follow the mandatory rules. Um, as a matter of fact, I need to admit that they do, um, they try to make the impression that they are structuring transparent processes. Um, the downside of a private tender is, of course, you have no, um, no possibility to appeal. If you are not happy with the choice of the public authority of a partner, you can't do anything about it, actually. Um, but, yeah, we live with it for the time being until we have a PPP law. Um, in infrastructure projects, important are, of course, as in any other joint venture, the contributions by the parties. Um, in, in, in PPPs, and this was mentioned again, um, of course, the, the public partner is trying to contribute everything else but money. So the funding is rather on the side of the, of the private partner or, or a third party investor, of course. Um, the, the, the contributions of the public partners are usually infrastructure, land, or other assets. The contribution can be made in the um, very standard form of an in-kind contribution, uh, which is done under corporate law. It can, be, it can be a lease or it can be a right of use, which is uh, granted to the uh, joint venture company. Um, we have been involved in two major projects in, in great disputes about the evaluation of the assets which the public partner is contributing. Um, the problem here is mostly that uh, these assets uh, either do not have a market value or that they are too old. I can tell you one example about a um, very big for our size is hydropower uh, project, which was started by the Bulgarian, uh, by the Bulgarian state approximately 40 years ago, so in the communist times. Approximately 30 years ago, they started to build some infrastructure. Um, currently, this project is still going on. Now, um, the Bulgarian government has a private partner, and the Bulgarian, gov uh, not Bulgarian government, the uh, um, Bulgarian utility company, is contributing this old infrastructure into the project company. So, firstly, of course, there is no market value for this infrastructure, and secondly, the private partner is saying this is all nice, but this pipeline, which was built uh, 30 years ago, is absolutely inefficient and non-compliant with current technology standards. So, we are uh, still in a dispute about the value or the evaluation of this asset, which, which will be contributed by the uh, public partner. Um, expropriation of private properties. This is an issue, um, of course, with with bigger scale projects. Um, the expropriation is always uh, on the part of, of, um, of the public partner, as a responsibility of the public partner. Um, the expropriation may be permanent, temporary, or just a limitation of the ownership rights, just right of passing, for example. Um, and it has to be always against compensation, of course. Um, what we are providing for in the joint venture agreement um, is that in the event of liquidation of the company, all the assets which were contributed by the public partner go back to the public partner or to the state. Um, to be honest, I haven't seen it in practice because the usual practice is if you liquidate the company, you need to sell everything and, and then um, allocate the, the liquidation quota among the partners. So I'm not sure um, how this would work in practice, but everyone is providing for it. Um, obligations of the public partner is also the ancillary infrastructure. I've seen it always forgotten in projects on which we have worked in, in Southeastern Europe. Um, roads and especially in the energy sector we've written substations and transmissions infrastructure. 
Um, we had a very big project for a few years, a hydropower plant to be built in Macedonia, um, somewhere in the middle of the mountains, and the state has just forgotten that someone has to build the roads uh, to the construction site, and that these have to be big and very stable roads because, of course, the machines which are going there are, are huge and that you need um, transmission network and that you need substations. So, um, of course, when you, when you raise these issues, then in the process of negotiation, actually, um, these this, uh, changes also the uh, financial cal calculations of the project on both sides. And of course, the public partner is responsible for the permits and for the environmental impact assessment, um, where the public partners usually forget that this takes one year exactly. So you can't start building before doing um, the environmental impact assessment because this takes four seasons of the year to see what the birds are flying, where fishes are swimming, uh, what the birds are breeding um, in that area. And especially if you have a public, pa if you have a private partner um, who is a foreign investor or. or who are listed companies, uh, they, can't afford, uh, they can't afford shortening this process. Um, cash, yes, sometimes also the public partners have to commit that they uh, contribute cash, um, be it uh, according to some pre-agreed plan, be it in the course of capital increases. Um, and this has a huge deadlock potential because you may do the best business plan uh, for the next 10 years, but at the end you will depend on the liquidity of the public partner and on the willingness of the state to, to finance the public partner if need should be. Um, state support, of course, big projects receive state support, um, share pledges for the purposes of financing, states issue um, letters of comfort. You will rarely see, at least in our region, um, a letter of guarantee, which is worth money. Uh, the letter of comfort is a political statement, but not much more. So if the public partner is not paying or not contributing cash when they should be, um, you can forget it. You can't enforce a letter of comfort and receive um, money against it. Um, in the energy sector, we've seen um, support by the state in the form of long-term uh, power purchase agreements. That means that a state-owned company concludes with the uh, joint venture agreement which generates electricity, a long-term power purchase agreement, and that means that the joint venture, the, the infrastructure company, can sell the electricity they produce to the public company at very beneficial terms and at very beneficial rates. The problem here in Europe, to be honest, I don't know how the situation is in Russia with state aid. Um, under European law, the state is not allowed to support by any financial means any companies, including uh, state companies. This is firstly invalid and secondly, then the country can be subject to um, significant fines. Um, so we have in Bulgaria currently two major thermal power plants with long-term power purchase agreements. Um, which provide for a public company to purchase the electricity at very beneficial rates, which of course are then translated um, into the electricity which is unsold to, um, to the consumers. Um, so Bulgaria itself um, notified itself to the European Commission saying please check our long-term power purchase agreements and judging on the experience of other countries, for example in Hungary and in Poland, long-term power purchase agreements were um, decided not to be compliant with state aid rules. That means that the European Commission may tell that the power purchase agreement are invalid, um, which is of course bad then for the um, PPPs which are producing the electricity because they had certain certainty, obviously business plans, financing, um, actually uh, uh, relying that they have an, an, an offtake for the electricity at certain prices for the next like 20 years, um, so let's see what happened. This is still pending before the European Commission. Uh, the contributions of the private partner, um, of course, always know-how. I forgot to manage the public partner and the private partner, of course, always have certain know-how. Um, but it is mostly the responsibility of the private partner to either ensure, um, to, to either to finance or to ensure the financing, to identify financing institutions and to, uh, to lead the negotiations. Uh, private partners may give guarantees. Um, you would see usually corporate guarantees, seldomly um, bank guarantees, but it's also possible. And also the uh, private partner would pledge its shares to secure uh, a third party financing if necessary. Um, 
Yeah, the public partner is, is, is usually also interested in securing control over the operations of the companies. Um, we see in the energy sector a lot of 50-50 joint ventures, uh, which means for any uh, major decision you need, you need um, um, unanimity anyway. Um, what we call otherwise the, the golden share, this is where the public partner has a minority interest only, um, but they have a veto right on, on, on certain decisions or you have a very detailed catalog with matters on which both parties must consent. Um, and the representation is usually a four eyes principle. That means two people are, um, at least two people together are representing, and we call it a cross representation. It's always one director nominated by the public partner and one director nominated by the private partner. Um, deadlock. Uh, deadlock means that uh, the partners cannot agree on a certain matter. This would be mostly the budget, as we have seen it at all, or this is what um, everyone is afraid from. Um, deadlock solutions means that the joint venture agreement must provide for what is happening if the parties can't find an agreement. Um, we would usually provide for in, in joint venture agreements on PPPs for a deadlock solution in certain matters only, mostly as said with regard to the budget or capital increases. Um, you should provide here also for um, an interim solution um, in a private joint venture, the deadlock solution would immediately kick in and something is happening within one to two months um, if the parties can't find an agreement. Um, for, for PPPs, you sh would need an interim solution so that the company can function over the next, let's say, eight to ten months. Um, the usual, the standard deadlock solutions, which are um, used in, in, in private deals, uh, having the nice names of Texas Shootout or even Russian Roulette, which is very suitable, um, that means that um, the partners can make uh, to each other offers to purchase um, and uh, to force the other partner to purchase or to sell shares. Uh, Texas shootout and Russian roulette are just different principles. This is not always appropriate because you don't want to be the private partner who has forced the state to sell its shares and then continue operating for the next uh, 10 years a project in, 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 in that jurisdiction. Uh, so what you would usually see is a put option for the private partner. Uh, that means that the pri if, if it comes to a deadlock, if there is no solution, yeah, the private partner can tell, you take my shares, and, and you have a formula how the private partner is paid. Plus, if the private partner would acquire the shares from the public partner, that would usually or likely trigger a privatization process, and, and, and then you come into a regulation, which is then far too complicated. Um, and I'm coming to the end. Um, some practical difficulties which we have seen in, in our region, I can't tell if it's better in Russia. Um, we see public partners who are very experienced in their relevant uh, practice area, for example in energy, but they totally lack um, transactional expertise, so they, are, uh, they find themselves for the first time um, when they need to negotiate a joint venture and they unfortunately then lack understanding of, of what is actually going on and what matters are really relevant. Unfortunately, we also see a great hesitance, at least at the beginning of projects, by public partners to hire external advisors. I would assume this has budgetary reasons on the one hand. On the other hand, um, they believe their in-house departments can, can, um, can do such a transaction. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than we usually see an external advisor coming in at a very late stage. So it's a bit of a fight against windmills sometimes. Um, and, and this type of projects, um, especially in the energy sector, because this is A, a sensitive center, B, these are um, projects with a very big financial impact, are usually very politically and socially sensitive. Um, we see in our region public partners having to um, defend themselves, uh, literally, why they uh, don't realize the project on their own, why they are taking um, private partners, especially when it is a foreign partner. So uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, local governments um, require in the joint venture agreement that the project is to a certain percentage of the value um, assigned to local suppliers and local contractors, which is sometimes absurd, and I'm ready in a minute. Um, I'll just tell you an anecdote. We had, uh, we had a big project. I mentioned it, a big hydropower plant project in Macedonia. The value was close to 1 billion euro. 
Um, most, uh, most of the value was uh, to be spent on the construction works and on two or three um, turbines for the production of the electricity. Um, and the Macedonian government uh, required in the first draft of the joint venture agreement that 60% of the project value, like 60% of 1 billion, is assigned exclusively to local companies. So you can imagine how many Macedonian uh, construction companies are able to build a power plant and how many are able um, to deliver a turbine because it turned out the, the I think the only producer of suitable uh, turbines was Siemens and I think they were not producing exactly in Macedonia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. As uh, we could all hear, there are quite a few similar complexities in packaging the projects properly. We have the same in Russian jurisdiction, and so we now know that uh, it happens the same way in the EU countries. It was very interesting for me to hear uh, about the problems of packaging the project for the state, uh, for the state partner with no uh, third party, with no independent advisors. Uh, the preparation stage, as described by Alexandra, was very interesting. I'm sure a lot of advisors will agree that uh, at the Russian market we do have similar issues. With regard to PPP, very few public partners uh, and very few regions uh, or federal agents, uh, regional or federal agencies, have enough competency to start the implementation of a project, initiating implementation of a project, to be able to stand on the same level as negotiators with regard to complicated issues. They cannot be equal in this regard to private partners. So, Alexandra, I have a question to you. I was greatly surprised by the fact that EU law will contradict the long-term power purchase agreements. In Russia, we do have a very successful scheme to conclude agreements on electricity supplies, which guarantee certain profitability for the investor building energy projects with some fixed tariffs and volumes of power that will be sold throughout the life cycle of this project. And those projects in Bulgaria that are based on this mechanism and at the same time they um, have certain contradictions with the European law. Is it the reason why you said that PPP Act in Bulgaria was cancelled by the next um, government? Um, no, this is not necessarily um, it's not necessarily connected. The, the long-term power purchase agreements um, would be fine if uh, they do not put the companies which have them in, in a more favorable position than other um, market competitors. Yeah? So it's, of course, a more complex topic. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally, this is how you measure it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it seems like, I mean, let's see what the European Commission is saying, but it seems like that these guys have a, um, a, a very big um, market advantage compared to to, um, to any other competitor, and it's it, it's a complex topic because we now have the liberalization of the market. They should be able, everyone on the market should be able to sell to everyone. We lack the infrastructure, so this is not possible. And and basically, whoever does not have a such a beneficial contract is a bit in a disadvantage. So that's that's the topic. Um, and the cancellation of the PPP Act. Uh, I think it's, it was more of a political. Um, at the end, they were fearing that it's um, not possible to um, to secure transparency. This is what they were blaming. Others are saying the law was revoked because um, it would have secured transparency, but it was not wished to have transparency. So um, it's it's a very sensitive topic, like everything, to be honest, which is uh, related to public procurement in, in Southeastern Europe. <laughs> Ну что ж, получается, что действительно вот, антимонопольные требования э, не настолько... So these anti-monopoly requirements are so sensitive uh, to the European uh, law 
that uh, even these um, objective mechanisms which guarantee investors returns uh, of their investments in the long run, this is still not enough uh, to ensure implementation of this uh, project um, because due to these uh, problems with competition. Thank you, Alexandra. What you have described is very interesting and it demonstrates how many common things are there between our two countries in the area of infrastructure. At the same time, there are, um, you mentioned uh, some of the things which are uh, discussed in Europe and we actually never consider them, that they will be related to public and private partnership. I would like to give the floor to Elisa Mityaeva, who is Deputy Head of Investment Projects of the Support Division from the Leader Company. Okay, um, pension um, funds as a source of financing of infrastructure projects. This is something obvious that should be a driver of infrastructure development in um, Russia. At the same time, there are not so many examples when pension funds uh, invest um, in such projects. And your company is a leader, and really, this reflects uh, the name of your company. You are a leader in this area, and could you please touch upon difficulties that you come across when you use um, these uh, funds, and what are legal uh, challenges in this uh, sphere, and uh, in a provision of these um, guarantees which are especially needed when we use uh, pension funds. I would like to thank all the colleagues for joining us uh, here in this discussion. Can I have remote control, please? At the beginning of my presentation, I would like to say that the key word here is, uh, is really the pension. Uh, funds. Uh, um, this is the most um, demanded uh, uh, instrument for implementation of investment projects because th this can be used in the long um, run and uh, it is possible to ensure uh, good uh, rates. But at the same time, with uh, all this uh, demand uh, in uh, Russia, there's no um, use or we don't see any practice of using uh, pension funds in infrastructure projects in Russia. So on the one hand, there are opportunities. On the other hand, um, there are difficulties. And we still don't see a good bridge among these two. We are still at very initial stages. As for the high uh, demand, of pension funds for infrastructure de uh, development, we can state that Russia occupies definitely not one of the leading positions. One of the major problems here is the lack of culture of long-term investments in this country. And everything I'm going to describe will be actually elements of this um, overlapping problem. And until we work this out, we will never, we will never see this bridge uh, filling uh, this gap between requirements and uh, the uh, possible use. Right. Um, firstly, today we see that the only possible way of using pension funds for investments is a concession, not even public and private partnership, but a concession. So, because uh, these investments um, should be highly regulated. So on the one hand, it is a way to protect these investments. On the other hand, uh, it uh, limits it and puts lots of constraints. And uh, preferably, 
it would be greater to use a wider range of mechanisms and instruments, but it is still not possible. On the other hand, that our support and our voice in the area of amendments of the concession law. By the way, this year the concession law will be 10 years old. We should be very active and our voice should be heard because if the um, rights of the concessioner are not um, met and protected, then there are no, uh, there's no protection of interests of the investor. So we are trying to contribute to making this type of investments most uh, efficient in the investment environment. Going back to the problems in this area, I can say that pension funds cannot be used in concession projects. Why? And, and they cannot be used for new projects. Why? Because at the end of 2014, the Central Bank um, of Russia, this financial regulator, and they actively help us um, to invest in infrastructure as well. So they um, formulated a special requirement um, to credit rating of um, investors and currently it is absolutely impossible there's um, a draft amendments uh, correcting uh, the situation but currently this is this requirement is effective and it means uh, that we cannot invest uh, pension funds um, into new projects it's one of the most serious projects Secondly, a second major problem, and this has been touched upon by Michael already, and it can be, um, it is typical for project financing in general, not only infrastructure projects. This is return the, that we as an investor would like to see for the majority of projects. And this uh, stimulus, even in public and private partnership, uh, where uh, the concessioner takes only part um, of the risk, so until we see something similar, these investments again will be very uh, problematic and difficult. Uh, difficult. The uh, 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 state um, uh, pension funds in the current state of, infl in of inflation, actually this is something that should be used, and I'm absolutely sure that for a number of uh, major infrastructure projects, this uh, opportunity will be used by the um, government, and we hope that some um, bidding materials uh, will be uh, will be revised. We participate in some uh, projects in Moscow, and we hope that um, the situation will improve because banks would like to see something different. So they would like to get favorable conditions for um, obtaining loans and um, attraction of funds. But the pension funds also want to uh, protect themselves. The government uh, doesn't explain to us how this can be resolved. What does it mean? It means that we are optimizing the cost of these projects, and this is extremely important, and this should be most important for the budget. Then there are problems related to um, regulation specifics. We are now delegates of the legal forum, and today Vladislav was uh, discussing a private initiative. And he said that uh, private investors are not ready to invest uh, within this uh, scenario. And it's not only because this is something new and uh, um, that we want to see what mistakes will be made by other people. No, but there are lots of uh, practical problems, and this is not resolved in the regulation. For example, compensation of expenses for design uh, development of the project. Then there's a question, what about this initiator? Maybe this initiator will have um, some specific um, conditions, and it, it, it will be in a favorable condition. 
and uh, I'm sure that all this should be reflected in the law. Then, such institutions as direct agreements in the concession law, this should be more detailed. It is necessary to specify in the law what should be included there. And uh, Pulkova Airport, um, I believe there's a direct agreement under the English law and um, another project where the investor and the um, grantor um, assigned a very complicated agreement, but it is protected at the level of law. And now we have uh, such a, a player as uh, bond uh, holders. This is also quite interesting. It's not a new one. Uh, internationally, uh, this insti institute has existed for a long time. We need to develop it, and we need to sell um, this uh, package um, as um, a candy, you know, and. Uh, Investors should be ready to spend uh, their money like this. Then in the sphere of um, residential uh, construction and uh, public utilities, so very often uh, certain uh, things are absolutely impossible in this sphere. So we can continue uh, describing drawbacks that uh, need to be resolved. But going back to my very first uh, statement, I should again stress that the major problem is the lack of culture of long-term investments, and we all should work on this. Thank you very much. And uh, I have a traditional uh, question, and I keep asking it all of um, uh, the speakers, you as a manager of uh, pension um, savings, do you see yourself as an investor, not uh, in um, public and private uh, partnership projects, but in this uh, corporate um, structure uh, projects? Um, you, you know, if we uh, speak about these um, pension funds, we cannot afford such investments. As I said, there is a certain limitation uh, for um, us in um, the law. It is in the budget code and in a number of other documents. If we accept that these constraints are modified or are taken away, uh, then with um, the appropriate guarantees. Yeah, I believe we will be ready to consider this. But at the same time, you're speaking only about public uh, partners. But what if uh, it is uh, the market players, like uh, in RFPI uh, projects, this uh, direct investments uh, fund, there, there's no public play at all. It is only uh, market um, players. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have these opportunities even now. But the matter is that the return we can ensure and transparency of um, obligations um, are taken up by the counter agent. This is uh, the factor to be considered. Thank you, Elisa. Now I would like to give the floor to Michael Popov, who is Director for Legal Affairs um, from RT Invest Transport Systems. Michael Popov is well known that he, together with a team of managers and a federal agency, Ross Afterdoor, they concluded the last, the latest famous concession deal. It was um, about 12 ton vehicles. So could you please tell us about those difficulties you came across and uh, the latest developments? Because this was a classical concession with the limited risks on the part of the investor to return investments. And uh, thanks to this limited risk, you as an investor decided to take part in it. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for this opportunity to speak here. Really, this project I'm going to speak about, it's a classical concession. 
with a um, not very simple um, object, but it's a classical concession agreement in um, the area of transportation. Transportation and transport system is one of the most attractive spheres for public and private partnership projects. By the end of um, last year, out of 10 projects um, that were approved for the National uh, Welfare Fund, seven were from transportation. Um, a lot of experience has been gained in this sphere, and and transport uh, infrastructure uh, projects and transport infrastructure projects are um, a priority. The project I'm going to tell you about, the first idea um, was developed long time ago by the Ministry of Transport. The main principle was that the user pays or the user should pay. And actually it is about fairness. It's not about uh, improving the situation for everyone, no, but it is uh, about fairness. Every vehicle using the roads uh, should uh, compensate for the damage they cause. So this uh, notion is not uh, legal in its principle, and it is more in the social significance sphere. The idea itself has been discussed for a long time by the government and uh, various investors were analyzing it. And in August last year, finally, a uh, government decree was issued and the concessioner was um, uh, determined. And in September of 2014, a concession agreement was signed. This system involves Mm, payments um, to compensate um, for damage caused by vehicles uh, with a weight of over 12 tons. So these trucks, they damage uh, the roads uh, and th this damage is thousands of times higher than the damage by regular cars. So this um, is what I'm saying, fairness. Yeah, so they cause more damage and they should pay. So the object of this project is quite comprehensive, is very complex by nature. It uh, combines uh, different elements of um, uh, very uh, many elements. So first, it is data processing unit, uh, then uh, various uh, tracking uh, devices, and uh, complicated hardware and software, including uh, maps. So we need to uh, take new uh, measurements. Uh, because we don't know uh, the exact um, uh, measures and coordinates of the current uh, roads. And uh, all this makes this project slightly uh, different, but we also have uh, classical infrastructure assets, some elements. You are lucky that um, part uh, of this immovable project was already part of the project. Yeah, and it is very important for this, uh, for functioning of this system. And that is why it is uh, something very logical. Then uh, there were some interesting legal issues. Actually, it is the issue of the legal nature of tolls we are charging. Definitely, it is not a tax, and it is not a payment within a public and private partnership project. So there are debates, what could it be called? Some uh, specialists um, said that it is something, some imposed charge. And in um, many um, 
in, uh, uh, there's a government decree and all vehicles uh, with a weight over 12, um, the thousand, uh, 12 tons, uh, they should pay the same amount. Of course, there will be um, various theoretical um, discussions and I'm sure there will be some publications about it, but in practice this is less relevant because there's a norm. There's a norm uh, by law, and uh, it will become effective from the 15th of November 2015. So starting from that day, we, being an operator, we will start charging this toll. It's legally interesting to understand uh, the status of the operator as compared to the owner. The system provides uh, for a need to list uh, the vehicle owner. Uh, the, vehicle, uh, the, uh, the vehicle owners should transfer the payment to the operator's accounts. This is an interesting tool. Two, it will require, most probably, some more research. But on the whole, I believe that such projects uh, make the law enforcement practice much richer. With regard to concessions uh, in particular and with regard to PPP as a whole. Besides, uh, they support regulation, the impact uh, upon regulation, because uh, we have uh, had to introduce some amendments to the current law. I am firmly convinced uh, that uh, this first project of such kind will open the way to more projects uh, similar to it in the Russian regions and at the federal level. I know that the federal, uh, I know that the regional authorities are very much focused on the possibilities to introduce such schemes and I'm sure they will be soon granted this right by the government. Thank you. This is really a type of a project uh, which is very positive for the Russian economy. And all the toll money will go into road development. And of course, road building is one of the most interesting sectors, economically speaking. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Would you like to become a project investor if it were structured not based upon law 115? Well, it's quite difficult for me to answer this question. I believe the project is uh, so interesting per se that it's not the structuring principle but uh, the social and economic effect for the investors uh, that's of most interest. Okay. I believe that for the public agencies implementing this project together with your agency, one of the reasons uh, to use concession as a basis of uh, implementation, even though the law on road construction did not give any preference to, to concession, there was nothing binding with regard to concession. So I think one of the reasons of this choice uh, was that the payment uh, which eventually shall be made uh, to the state body is the most structured one and uh, federal law number 115 is exactly the right tool to secure this payment. This uh, payment for availability can be paid not as a subsidy, not as a reimbursement for costs, but uh, as a payment under the concession agreement uh, to compensate all the costs, uh, all the expenditures of investors. Other corporate schemes uh, would be more complex to use uh, to secure this uh, absolutely legal long-term compensation to investor. Well, this project does have a lot of social significance uh, and uh, it's a very open project. We 
we are paid the toll money and uh, the amount is absolutely transparent. The government agencies know how much it is. Otherwise, uh, these uh, payments would not be as transparent as this. So the state pays a fixed amount and it's verifiable and it's transparent. Well, I didn't expect you to be the person to mention the word openness. After governmental resolution was issued on the single concessioner of your company, of your company being the single concessioner of uh, the project. Well, all the terms were clearly stipulated. The terms of the concession agreement are very clear and uh, they are in the public domain. Okay, Mikhail, that's what, that was meant as a joke. I hope everybody understands uh, why it happened the way it happened, especially remembering the sanctions and the problems of the few recent years. I would now like to grant the floor to our final speaker, who is Dmitry Timofeyev, the Legal and Corporate Affairs Director for Rosvodo Canal Group. I can intuitively feel that this very positive attitude uh, that we all now have with regard to concessions and PPP schemes can be can be destroyed by Dimitri because uh, Rosswater Canal projects, uh, both planned and actively implemented in the area of infrastructure, have to face uh, some problems, especially in what regards tendering for those projects in the regions. Uh, there is lack of transparency. It's somehow very much, all of it is somehow very much out of line. The PPP legislation should develop. Am I right or not? Thank you. Colleagues, I would like to start by apologizing for coming late to this discussion. Uh, while we are discussing PPP projects, they are being implemented. So I've just come here from the fields, so to speak. Never out of negligence or disrespect for this panel discussion. I had to spend most of the day today speaking over the telephone. Ross Vodder Canal is one of the major private investors at uh, this very significant market of water supply and sewage. Our portfolio now has the first uh, concession in the field of utilities that's in the town of Voronezh. So we know these pro all the discussed problems firsthand. Uh, our portfolio has some concession investments under Law 115. In a number of Russian towns, we are investing and le into lease of uh, property that uh, we shall later operate. I would now like to share some of the problems with you, the problems that we see as investors and the problems that exist for foreign investors. If uh, they ever decide to invest into this strange Russian industry called the utilities sector. I hope you understand that uh, whatever I say in this audience should not be heard as the as an official statement of Ross Water Canal. I am making this uh, waiver because right now Water Canal is uh, taking part in a number of uh, tenders. So once I start talking about the problems, I do not want uh, my statements to be extrapolated to specific projects uh, under implementation right now. Those projects are complex and difficult. And uh, they sometimes have to fight uh, some gaps in the business logic and in the current legislation. So I'll try to be logical. We're discussing investments here, and investments are a very logical thing. There is always some 
entity with an interest. Uh, this is normally a very professional entity who has a business model and who has a wish and who has a financial model and who has money to invest in some projects with the purpose of getting some profits, which means that the process has to be transparent. It uh, must uh, provide a return on investment for the investor. Even in the area of utilities, we are still talking commercial utilities market, which means the investor wants to get his money back. So what will every or any investor see if uh, he decides to invest into water supply and sewage sector in Russia? First of all, he will see that it's not an easy thing to do. Since last year, you can only invest under Federal Law 115. You cannot lease, not even via a tender. That option is closed down. Law 115 is structured in such a way that even when there is a will of the president, even though he has issued instructions to gradually give the sector over to the private sector to make things easier for the budget and to make expenditures in the sector more efficient. The Federal Utility Sector Development Program has been drafted, but it's still next to impossible to do a tender. Under Law 115, you can have a concession only for the property that's registered, for which all the rights of property are registered. But uh, take any Russian town, take water supplies and uh, sewage and uh, water treatment, and you will see that 40 percent of uh, property belongs to God knows what. In legal terms, this, these pieces of property do not exist. In the Russian town of Chelyabinsk, they have announced a public tender, and uh, the agree concession agreement only covers 10 percent of the property in the water supply and uh, water treatment system in the city. The rest, uh, the 90 percent, is uh, legally non-existent. So the town is really the uh, municipal authorities are really surprised not to see any investors rushing to them. We are working actively with the regulators uh, with the intention of uh, getting amendments, getting the law amended. Uh, we need to overcome these obstacles. Property shall be given over to concessions, uh, even though there are no registered right of property. And either the concedent or the concessioner should be given the right uh, of dealing with this property for two or three first years of the project. Now, what about the payback on investment, uh, the return on investment? The utility sector is different from other sectors because uh, the only place the money sits is uh, the tariffs. Uh, you can invest, you can sell water in uh, tanks or bottles, but uh, the key source of uh, your, rather our, income will be the tariffs, which means that uh, when you assume the responsibilities, uh, the liabilities under the concession agreement, the liabilities to uh, update uh, and upgrade the infrastructure uh, you are going to manage, uh, you want to be sure that uh, your costs uh, shall be eventually covered. It's a tough business thing to say, but it's the consumer who will cover your costs because the tariffs have an investment component. But today we have a discrepancy between Law 115 and uh, the Law on Water Supply and Sewage. The problem is that uh, if uh, the concession law says that uh, a, the concession agreement can include uh, the liabilities of the municipal authorities uh, to guarantee a long-term tariff for 
certain parameters of water supply. But the tariff laws do not allow for that. And uh, the agencies uh, fixing the tariffs are not party to the concession agreement. So the investor will see that all his plans and all his financial models could be put directly to the waste paper basket because uh, whether or not he will be able to agree the, re the desired tariffs remains a huge question. Now I would like to discuss another issue, which is a paradox in terms of investment. Again, in relation to the utility sector, water in Russia, water supply and sewerage so is a strategic industry. Look at the, uh, if you only want to see the documents or the plans for water supply lines in a town, you need to be state secret clearance, no less than that. Of course, that's a serious document. And uh, it takes us uh, about six months uh, to get clearance for our directors uh, and top managers. We have uh, analyzed the new law, and we can see from it that uh, even at the stage of application, forget the bidding, you have to get uh, state secrets uh, clearance. Uh, because uh, you need uh, to see the plans uh, and charts of water supply lines, uh, and that is considered top secret in this country. It really is, uh, it really looks strange. Uh, I've seen such plans for all the towns, so you know where the pump stations are located. Yes, I do, almost all of them. Well, pump stations are not that important, but uh, water treatment uh, plants uh, are really top secret. So if uh, we remember the offshore, the, or rather the counter offshore actions, uh, I would say no thanks. Uh, today, we are facing some problems getting clearance for our employees because Ross Water Canal holding Ross Water Canal groups group has some companies registered under foreign jurisdictions and the Federal Security Service just tell us a blank no, they don't give us any clearance just because of that. So this is a sore spot in investment area. And uh, the last thing I would like to tell you about is uh, the bidding itself. Remember, we've been talking about uh, the investment culture and uh, the need to develop it. But this is a two-way street. It's not only about the state that brings in investors. It's also about investors themselves. Remember, I told you that public utilities are a very special sector in Russia. You need to know how to work it. You need to have a lot of expertise and special knowledge. I came to this sector a year ago, and to be able to be able to convene technical meetings, it took me about six or seven months just to understand what what is it all about, the pipes, the cross sections, the diameters, and how it all works. If you take the law on concessions, we are not allowed to set qualification requirements for investors. If an investor produces some plain financial model that involves uh, some software to calculate profits not in a very correct, uh, correct way, like discounted uh, gross profits. So we are only talking figures. Uh, the investor may have no experience 
And this is something I don't understand. I have a lot of experience with retail. I've spent 10 years in retail, and I've now been working in the utility sector for one year. After 10 years in retail, I may r take the risk of uh, becoming director of a supermarket because uh, I understand uh, the goods matrix and so on. But uh, in the utilities, uh, it's about many other things, uh, many specialized uh, pieces of knowledge. And uh, when an investor doesn't have this knowledge, it, I believe that he really doesn't know what he is doing. This is about the safety of you and myself. Water is a strategic resource. You can stay, uh, you can survive with no heating and no electric light, but you cannot survive without water. So these issues uh, sit on the edge of business, logic, and law. So I believe that uh, if it all is brought together the right way, we shall be able to drink tap water, same as we did in our childhood. Thank you very much, Dimitri. If our audience have any questions at all, you are welcome to ask them. And I have a question to Dimitri. And uh, let us see which speakers will take which questions. Dimitri, you have said that since this year, the only way to structure utilities, utilities sector deals with uh, non-budgetary funds is concessions. At the same time, you have your experience with concession in Voronezh and uh, leasing property with water canal. So if you have several to you have experience with several tools. So the question is, is it good or bad uh, that uh, starting this year only inefficiently working water canal groups uh, will be passed to concessions? On, is it good or bad? Well, it's not a question of good or bad. I cannot answer your question this way. Yes, so we do. We are having a legal forum, so I'll, I shall try to explain it from the legal point of view. But. Uh, it's very much an economic explanation. Frankly speaking, my company, as of today, still doesn't have an answer to the question, what, it, what is better, concession or lease? And uh, the answer is not only about the law. It's very much about finance. We have no final opinion as to which is better for the investor. The concession agreement under the current law is not considered as a separate kind of agreement. We have different taxes, for example, the profit tax, the VAT, and our Supervisors tell us, guys, concession is a hybrid arrangement. And of course, they refer to Law 115. So please, they tell us, use the regulations on leaseholds, which is a very strange approach indeed. So why is concession more beneficial as a model under Law 115? The law clearly declares that the investor is protected. His return on investment is protected. In the towns where we invest via leasehold agreements, we are sometimes protected and sometimes we are not. If we could go on investing via leasehold, that would always be a preliminary process, uh, whether or not this should be included into the lease. But uh, lease is uh, complicated. Let's take the town of Omsk. We have 54 leasehold agreements there. I can see your faces going skeptical. But those 54 agreements 
include about 15,000 uh, water supply and sewage facilities. Some of those facilities may be complex, uh, like a pumping sta water pumping station. And what is a pumping station? This is not just one line in the cadastre. It may be 8 or 15 facilities uh, constituting a single whole. So we would lease a quarter of that pump station under one agreement, another quarter under another agreement, and the rest may be leased not from the municipal authority but from the municipal unitarian enterprise. That exists, and God knows what um, they are doing at the fourth um, quarter. Uh, it belongs to no one because it is not registered. And if we add uh, uh, to this uh, complexity that one is a long-term uh, lease agreement, another is uh, not registered, so it has no term actually. And how the investor should survive in this, we really are confused. We don't know how to deal with this. And we cannot even use the option for transforming uh, this uh, for the purposes of uh, concession. Because, as I said, the major problem is that all this property, 40% of it, it doesn't exist legally yeah, because it is not registered. And you, as consumers of water, even in St. Petersburg and I'm sure in Moscow it is exactly the same, you should know that um, this water gets to your place uh, via non existing pipes and uh, no one knows who is responsible for their maintenance uh, but you know I am a citizen of St. Petersburg and uh, I worked um, in the municipal property committee I can tell you that in St. Petersburg all pipes all these networks they are not only registered they do not only have inventory numbers and all that but they are registered as well they are registered as immovable property then please announce a tender and uh, we are going to take part in it no it's not uh, for me yes the city was uh, planning uh, to do it and of course the Ross water canal would uh, take part in it but you know listening uh, to you I believe that a concession is better because you are uh, describing all these nightmares nightmares with um, the lease agreements so for us as a bank when we consider all these risks that uh, loans might be not returned and the quality of um, uh, secured um, loans we believe that for us fewer risks are involved in um, the concession model and uh, we believe that this mechanism is uh, better described in terms of public participation in various agreements and uh, contracts as for a lease agreement okay it's all clear okay apart from what uh, um, uh, this uh, transfer of the property i won't uh, be able to guarantee anything uh, because uh, there's no law uh, regulating this and in the concession law there's everything about subsidies and uh, direct agreements and uh, you know some uh, payments if a certain level of returns is not guaranteed okay colleagues we have spent two hours and we described um, a possible legal um, models uh, for um, structuring these uh, projects and I remember that last year we were speaking only about public and private partnerships and we expected that in 2014 or maybe the beginning of uh, 15 the federal law on PPP will be adopted and lots of um, a panel uh, speakers, uh, they were discussing new norms uh, and adjustments um, uh, to the, this draft law, and everybody was so optimistic about uh, this federal law. Now uh, we see that uh, hearing all the news that come from the State Duma and the Ministry of Economic Development, we are not uh, so optimistic. But on the other hand, I am um, well, sitting here had an idea, I thought that maybe not everything is so bad, and the lack of this federal law 
PPP law. This uh, moves our authorities to improvement of the concession law, for example, and now it is really uh, it is uh, it has been enhanced and it is better. And now it is used in um, various areas. And on the other hand, look what is happening with the uh, civil uh, code, and this is the basis everyone is using and all legal mechanisms are based on that so a lot has been done by our researchers and uh, famous um, academics uh, so they have um, done so much and what could be done in the past only under the English law, and now it is possible here, and um, there's a national funds, uh, uh, they are using already, this, uh, and uh, the, these projects are structured under the existing Russian law. So maybe everything is not that bad, and probably even without the PPP law, we'll be able to protect investments. Um, that investors made into the Russian infrastructure. So actually, I see that I'm very much optimistic about it, about investments in the Russian infrastructure. All the not mechanisms, especially adjusted to the sphere, are available to us in Russian laws. And uh, I would like to add, colleagues, please invest. Right, I don't see any uh, questions. Oh, there is a question. Okay. I'm sure everyone knows you, but uh, for a recording, could you please introduce yourself? I'm from the Federal Road Agency, uh, from the Law Department. I have a question about private initiative, because we expect that there will be a great uh, interest uh, towards it. And uh, we uh, have uh, some investors who have been um, you know, making circles around us, and they keep asking questions when they will be able to work with us. Can I ask you, from the point of view of financial organization, OK, we uh, heard uh, some uh, conservative position that the market is not very much ready to take part in this quite an adventurous uh, venture. And but uh, nevertheless, we need to start with something, because every road starts with the first step. So my question is that if uh, some investors come to us with a question that they would like to go to public authorities with their ideas. And last year, we approved the methodology for packaging and structuring uh, the investment uh, project if um, national funds are involved. Uh, my question is uh, to the uh, bankers. What do you think about it? I have a question for you. So you, being a public body, aren't you scared by this? Are you concerned by this? No, the only point is uh, timing, yeah, because I'm uh, sure we will be criticized yeah, and we will have to prove our point that, yes, we are ready, that we have analyzed and all this. I believe that we, together with this initiator, we will try to change the perception of the financial and economic uh, block in uh, the government, but without the financial institutions. And you know, the financial block is um, not very fast in reacting, because when we say, yes, the banks are ready, everything will be fine, and the financing will be provided, um, but then uh, this dialogue uh, may be streamlined. Yes, I see that your role um, uh, is really um, great and important, yeah, and it's good for the market. I have uh, said already, when Vladislav was speaking about uh, this private initiative, uh, I said that we are 
a bit uh, c concerned and reluctant uh, to accept it because uh, it is a matter of scale. The biggest uh, banks, when they invest, in, uh, or those that can invest in um, projects, uh, there are not very many of them, just a few. And um, of course, they're interested in very big projects. And if um, it is um, a big one, or a small one, then it should be a very successful example, model, project. And as a rule, such projects, before they are initiated, uh, there should be an understanding whether it is uh, necessary to initiate it and whether this initiative uh, will be uh, approved um, and viewed as something um, appropriate by the grantor. And um, formally and informally, if uh, you have, uh, I don't know, the dozens uh, of uh, protocols of intentions with the regions, you need to check whether these are needed, whether these projects are needed. I am sure it is necessary to use some other uh, ways or tools of discussing uh, projects, uh, so not uh, a formal way of uh, apply, uh, presenting an application, then discussion of it, then understanding all the consequences for the public party and uh, all this uh, definitely uh, it, it, it will be like uh, you know pulling a trigger and uh, for investment banks yeah, I believe um, we don't view this mechanism as very favorable but for those investors who would like to implement some small-scale projects then for them, yeah, it is a good mechanism that will enable them to initiate a discussion of uh, their ideas and uh, the know-how that they would like to implement. But this, so, but these small-scale projects are not for big banks. So my skepticism is um, related to the fact that new projects are either small, too small uh, to make the banks interested, or there's some a concern that if these projects are very big, then probably the region doesn't need them, or the region won't be able to implement so big projects because they will have to allocate a lot of funds. But it may all change. Okay, so the situation as of today is, uh, there is, uh, we still have the risks uh, that uh, the risks uh, the risks uh, stay with the initiator, the risk of uh, both ways uh, being possible for funding. So the investor remains uh, just alone. Okay, this uh, new law is very good, but the investor will have to b fight the battle alone. Right. Unless uh, or until he convinces the bank that his initiative will be positively viewed by the future consident. The bank may, of course, have uh, a streamlined uh, channel of talking to the regions. Uh, if, uh, the, if he understands that the regions uh, mean two, one or two implementable projects, but that arrived not thanks to the PPP, it's thanks to other channels of receiving the information. I would like to add a couple of words. Alice is right. Uh, so far, we don't have a procedure for covering the costs of the initiator if the initiator does not uh, win the project. Under the current anti-monopoly law, we cannot give any preference to the initiator. There are different formats uh, used in other countries, including bonuses. Uh, that's uh, if the initiator offers 5% uh, less or even more percent less, so he still has a preference. But in this country, the anti-monopoly law does not allow that. So the initiator really has uh, to bear a lot of risk. Our relations with the banks uh, still mean that uh, some cost-related decisions uh, 
have to be taken, and it's a difficult situation for the banks. It's, and it's more risky at the decision-taking stage. When it is understood, when the bank understands that there is a project that will be implemented, the bank is more willing to accept the risk related to costs. But if there is a, still an opportunity to lose uh, the bidding, then uh, the risk is way less desirable for the bank. Thank you. Colleagues, do we have any more questions to the panelists? If not, let me thank all of you for your attention and for your activity. I believe we have discussed a lot of important issues today and see you at the next forum.